Welcome to So Money, everybody. It's Farnoosh. It's Friday, July 29th, 2022. We are soon going to be in August. The summer is escaping us. And as promised, this summer has had its fair share of economic data to worry over, right? The markets this week were very volatile as investors sifted through a lot of different economic news from the Fed's rate hike on uh, Wednesday. Uh, and then, of course, on Thursday, we had the GDP for the second quarter results in and lots and lots of earnings reports this week. We are kind of in the thick of earnings season, all eyes, especially on big tech bellwethers like Google and Meta, uh, Amazon. And the earnings reports are also mixed. But I think what we're really seeing closely, if we look at uh, some of the, the temperaments from these CEOs and as they look to the remainder of the year, uh, we are hearing things about you know hiring freezes and a slowdown in job growth and also layoffs. Shopify announced plans to lay off 10% of its employees, a thousand workers worldwide. And Shopify really such a barometer, right, of, of tech health, of e-commerce health specifically. So I think this is going to have ripple effects and not because I like to be a, a negative person or a critical person of, of the economy, but I, I do think that this unemployment number that we have 3.6% is going to see weakening in the months ahead. We're going to, it's, it's inevitable. I think that as the Fed raises rates, which they did again this week, we're going to see more pressure on business owners, on consumers. Uh, they're not going to be spending as much and companies aren't going to be hiring and growing as fast. And, and that's going to have bottom line effect on jobs. But you know what I really want to talk about is this GDP number that came out on Thursday. This is something that we've been anticipating for weeks at CNET Money. We've been, you know, like like nerds, just eyes glued to gross domestic product growth for second quarter. Why do we care so much about this number? It's because we know that in some forums, a recession is defined as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP, gross domestic product. That's the uh, total totality, the sum of all the goods and services produced in a country over a period of time. In the first quarter, of GDP dipped by 1.6%. And that was largely because of uh, the coronavirus and uh, unexpected closures of factories and increasing supply bottlenecks. And all of that led to a decline in sales and consumer spending and also output. So that was largely what's being credited for the decline in GDP in Q1. We thought it may be an anomaly. We thought, well, you know, that's just sort of what happens. <laughs> you know, we're in a pandemic and uh, it's not going to be a consistent thing. But now we know that in the second quarter of 2022, GDP continued to dip. So now, by some measures, we are in a technical recession. The NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, that committee is really who calls the shots. Uh, it's a forum of, um, I think, eight to 10 economists and very smart PhD holders. I wish they were more female and uh, more diverse, but you know, it's what we got. And they have yet to make the official call. They're going to look more at just the whole entire economy, not just GDP, but they're going to be looking at the employment numbers. And uh, my sense is that if they continue to see strength in the job sector, they're not going to announce that we are in a recession. But does it even matter, right? That's the other thing I want to talk about is just, I'm tired of this debate over whether we are in a recession or we are not. A recent poll found that 58% of Americans, if you ask them, they say, yeah, we're in a recession. We're hurting. You know, we can't afford basics. Uh, our wages have not kept up with this inflation rate. And we are worried about jobs. We are worried about ever being able to buy a home. Our credit card balances are ballooning. Can we be in a recession with unemployment still low? It would be uh, unconventional. It would be unusual for a recession to be called with unemployment where it is at 3.6%. But I, I look at sort of where wages are. Even if you have a job, okay, if you're lucky to have a job and you're annual increase since 2021 and your pay was like just 2% or 3% or flat, how are you affording food? How are you putting gas in your car? And so, yeah, maybe if we just look at unemployment rate, things look fine. But if you look at wage growth, which has, had, has only been an average of 5% year over year, while inflation is up 9.1%, 
It's hard to keep up with that. And I do think that if consumer spending is two thirds of the economy and what drives economic growth and consumer spending is dropping and will continue to drop unless we do something about inflation, how can we not see a contraction? How can we not see uh, a dip in GDP? Maybe that's not the most scholarly analysis of the economy, but it is how I see it. And I know that for many of us, it doesn't matter what we're calling this. You know, call it what you want, a recession. I saw Conan O'Brien tweeted, uh, like, let's call it the circumstances because we're seeing a lot of, uh, he, he was noticing that, you know, some restaurants were raising prices or you go to a, a, a business and they're like, oh, we have to raise our rates due to the circumstances. We all know what the circumstances are, but it's just a funny way to characterize it. So whether you want, whatever you want to call it, the reality is, is that the pain is real. And I would really appreciate if beyond just raising rates, we did other things to recognize that we're not going to be able to Fed rate hike our way out of this. You have to also address the supply issues. Raising rates is not going to overnight bring more supply into the market, which is really why we have inflation, I think. Um, So I would like to see our policymakers and our Elected leaders talk about that hard stuff that they have to do that may be painful in the short run. Nobody wants to talk about the difficult things that we have ahead because it's not good for the election season. It's not good for winning the the love of your voters. But we're all adults here. And we all know what's going on. We, there's a big elephant in the room and no one's really calling it out. And so whether we want to call it a recession or a bad time or let's just call it something and move on so we can start to get on with our lives and and do what's necessary. We know it's going to get harder before it gets easier. Let's just go there. And there was a, a perfect tweet. I don't really tweet a lot. I like to just be an observer on Twitter. Uh, and it was from Seth Mandel, who is a, the executive editor of the Washington Examiner magazine. He said, this is amazing. He said, it's not a recession unless it's from the recession region of France. Otherwise, it's just sparkling misery. You know, just like, let's stop the semantics. Uh, This sort of humor is, you know, it's really capturing the zeitgeist right now. Everybody's just really tired of going back and forth over the R word. Um, Last week's, this week's shows, I should say, were different, but each very important, I think, to talk about, especially right now. Speaking of the challenges that we're facing on Monday, we talked about money and millennials. You know, if you remember, uh, a lot of millennials arrived at the job market At the beginning of the Great Recession, I talked to a lot of them on uh, social media this week. A lot of you wrote in with your stories to me as we're looking to uh, cover this at CNET. And now in another recession, potentially. And so millennials have had uh, faced the brunt of many economic headwinds. Now they're all grown up. Some of them are in their late 30s, maybe even 40 years old. And they're wondering, why am I not further along? This interview was with Charlotte Coles. She is a contributor to the New York Times, and she wrote a feature recently for the Times called Why Millennials Are Facing More Anxiety Than Ever. She interviewed individuals across the country in various uh, financial states, and the common thread that she recognized and wrote about was their anxieties. They were Anxieties were palpable, she said, and painfully familiar because she herself also a millennial, Charlotte. And so we talked about how they have overcome the last uh, 15 years of challenges, I guess. And that was on Monday. Then on Wednesday, we talked about burnout. I should just call this the burnout show, but there's a better podcast for that. It's called Fried, the Burnout Podcast. And the host of that, Kay Donovan, stopped by So Money. And we talked about uh, something that we haven't really discussed when it comes to burnout on this show, which is that sometimes it has nothing to do with your job. I know it's not something we believe necessarily. We, we spend so much time at work. How could work not contribute to burnout? And and there's definitely an argument for that. Uh, but what she was really saying, Kate, is that sometimes the job is just a job and what we bring to the job, how we look at the job, how we interpret the job, oh, as far as like what is expected of us, it may just be in our heads. And we should not listen to that internal dialogue that's telling us to work more, you're not enough, things like that, which can lead to overwork and burnout. And yeah, it's a little bit of imposter syndrome and all of that. Uh, But we talked about the signs of burnout, what is it actually, and the steps you can take 
to get on the other side of it and and not to necessarily quit your job if you think that's what's going to solve burnout. Um, Kate said, frankly, you know, sometimes it's not about that. It's about figuring out what are these patterns, these behavioral patterns that you're experiencing, why maybe creating some boundaries, starting to say no, having a conversation with your boss, especially right now where things are so, you know, uncertain in the job market. It it may not be wise for someone to quit. Uh, I know that clearly if your health is at stake, you got to do what you got to do. But um, it was an interesting conversation, not not a direction I thought we were going to take, but I really appreciated her perspective. So that was on Wednesday, Kate Donovan talking about burnout. All right, let's go to the mailbag and pick our reviewer of the week. This person gets a free 15-minute money session with me. This week, we're going to say thank you to She Writes 11, who wrote a review earlier this week calling the show A New Mom's Inspiration. As a new mom, this podcast helps me better understand my full financial picture and just how greatly it impacts my daughter's future financial picture. Farnoosh is an inspiration to me and helps me see that being a mom who is financially literate is absolutely necessary in 2022 and beyond. Thanks, Farnoosh, for doing the work that will make a generational difference for my family and help equip my daughter with what she needs to have a life that is so money. I got goosebumps. And it's not just because my AC is on, but I really, I felt that she writes 11. And I would love to offer not just you, but also your daughter, a free 15-minute money session with me if you both want to get on the phone and we can chat about your money goals and any questions you may have about you know, the future. I don't have a crystal ball, but I would love to you know, especially your daughter who's got a lot probably exciting things headed for her. And uh, we want to make sure she's uh, on the right track. And I'm sure she already is, but I will be happy to give any feedback or guidance. So you just email me, farnushitsomoneypodcast.com. You can direct message me on Instagram and let me know you left this review. And I will be in touch with the link where you can pick a time for us to discuss. Okay. In the mailbag this week, I have to say, the housing market continues to keep us up at night. And a number of the questions this week pertain to real estate from different angles. You know, somebody's a first time buyer and wondering how to make it work. Another person is looking to buy a second home in another state as a potential investment property. Another person is telling me they're getting a cash loan from a relative so that they can be competitive in this housing market and land the house. So, Got lots of uh, thoughts on all of those things. Let's first start with an anonymous listener. She'd like to remain anonymous. And her question is about how to be a legitimate first-time buyer in this market. Uh, She's a longtime listener of the show. And here's the situation. She says, I'm 29. I live in Nashville. I was just told that my rent will be going up by $200 a month. I cannot justify paying more. And I'm now trying to decide if I should finally try to buy or continue to rent. I've also recently received $8,500 Recently, from a car accident settlement, I moved four times in the last five years, and I'm so tired of moving. Plus, I hate that I'm paying so much for something that I don't own. I feel ready to own, and I'm craving that sense of security, but I have no idea how to do it, and I'm embarrassed for where I am financially. I have over 50000 in my 401k and Roth IRA. I have another 3000 in a robo-advisor account. I was planning on using the settlement money for a down payment. And, you know, I have $10,000 in credit card debt for uh, some recent travel and uh, related costs. I want to start a business. I also have a car payment, student loans, about 13000 in student loans. And uh, yeah, that's me. I just, however, did double my salary and now making $130,000 a year. So this is our friend in the audience and her quick snapshot of her finances. So six-figure income, uh, not a little bit of student loan debt, about 13000 split between federal and private. She's got this $8,000, $8,500 car accident settlement. That's a nice lump sum of cash to do something with that. She's tired of renting. Her rent's going up. She's now ready to buy or thinks she's ready to buy. So some questions for me. All right, Farnoosh, should I put half of that $8,500 settlement towards my credit card debt um, and then the rest maybe towards a down payment? Or should I focus on paying off that credit card debt entirely 
or <laughs> lots of options here, just put it all in a high yield savings account. And then as far as buying a home, do you recommend uh, a zero down payment option? Do I even have that option? And I heard about, you know, there are some loans with lower down payments. I feel stuck is the bottom line, she says. And I feel like after all this, you're going to tell me I'm being a little unrealistic and you should just continue to rent, but would love to hear uh, what you think. Okay. So are we ready to hear what I think? I do have a bottom line thought for you, but I want to kind of take a few steps back and explain where I'm coming from. Um, And so to review, a few rules that I like to follow and the the advice I like to give when anyone is considering buying a home, especially in this very competitive market. Down payment, yes, there are programs that may, first-time buyer programs that may give you the option to put down as little as 3.5%. But if you really want to be competitive in this market where you've got cash offers and people putting down substantially more a 3.5% down payment is probably not going to win you a house in this market. Also, I have issues with people just putting down 3.5%. Again, especially in this market where prices are coming down in some areas. If you bought a house last year and now, there's a chance that your home has declined more than 3 or 5%. And if you only put down 3.5%, well, then technically you're now underwater. And that may not mean that you're going to have to foreclose, but it's not a great place to be in. And so I have concerns about these FHA loan programs for first-time buyers with such minimal down payments because it assumes that home prices are always going to go up, but sometimes they don't. And then you might be in a real pickle. So there's a risk to that. 20% now and always is the ideal amount that you're putting down. And you also have to realize that that may not be enough to compete still with some of these other offers that are coming in that are cash only. Like later, we're going to talk to a listener who's getting a full cash loan from a relative. How are you going to compete against that? So 20% down payment, rule number one. Rule number two, be sure that your monthly housing costs, whether you're renting or owning, but in this case, we're talking about owning, do not exceed more than 30% of your take-home pay. I know that some calculators are more generous and they say, try to spend no more than 30% of your gross pay. But again, I think in this economy, it's better to be conservative. And that way, you can also address your debts. Um, So this is a rule of thumb, particularly for those of us who have some outstanding debt and are worried about where housing prices might be going. Um, Do not pay more than 30% of your take-home pay towards housing-related costs. That includes your mortgage, And if you can squeeze it in, your taxes and your maintenance, but really no more than 30% for your mortgage. A bank who'd give you a bigger loan, I don't buy it. So now you know where I'm coming from. I'm a bit conservative when it comes to purchasing a home. And so let's do some math based on what you've told me, based on your income and what we think you might be able to afford in this market with where interest rates are. So you make $130,000 a year. After taxes, I'm going to guess that's close to about $100,000. I actually looked this up online. I put in your uh, your state, which you said is, I believe, Tennessee. And according to the calculations, your net your net take-home pay is it's a little under $100,000, $8,300 a month. So with $8,300 net, going back to my earlier formula, the housing budget that I would recommend for you is roughly... a month, 30% of your take-home pay. So that's what you can, up to what you can afford on a monthly basis comfortably. So a $2,500 a month mortgage, assuming you put down the recommended 20%, and then also an interest rate today of anywhere from 5.5% to 6%, depending on your credit score, you're looking at a home with a sale price of about $500,000. Okay, so that's what we know is what we're going to shoot for. I'm not going to tell you you can't do this, but I'm going to say, here's what we now know is the goalpost. And now, if you want to give yourself a couple of years to work towards that, what will it take to reverse engineer what you're going to need to afford this home, including about $100,000 down payment, uh, a good credit score. So make sure your credit score is at least in the 700s and a job that continues to pay you what it's paying you now, hopefully more, as the years go on. 
A home is the biggest purchase we will ever make in our lifetime for most of us. Some of us are buying yachts now, but I suspect nobody on the show listening is buying a billion dollar yacht. If you are, let's get in touch. You don't want to rush into this. And I think the one silver lining that I see in the market for prospective buyers, not so much for sellers, is that prices are coming down. We're not going to go back to uh, the debacle that we saw in 2009, the housing meltdown. But I do think that, would you be surprised if someone said in, in a couple of years, prices came down a little bit? Yeah, because they went up like 50% in some markets in just two years. And in this market of Montclair, New Jersey, where I live, I get these reports every so often from uh, these real estate agents, and they give us the breakdown of what a home listed for and what it sold for. And some of these homes are going for 50 to 80% above asking. This was in May, June. Um, So it's a very tight market still. But I think as interest rates go up, more buyers will go to the sidelines. Prices will have to come down because of that decreased demand. And we're already seeing that happen. So as a prospective buyer in the next one to two years, I do think you're going to have more options, but you have to work on your money. You know, I know it's painful to pay more in rent. Everybody who's renting can probably say that as well, that their rents are going up. Um, but I don't know. Did you pay less in the pandemic? Because rents did go down substantially in the pandemic. So now we're sort of making up for that. And I want to refute the notion that paying rent is a waste. I have very smart financial expert friends who intentionally rent. Why? It buys them flexibility, liquidity, more liquidity. And they would argue that you could take the difference between what it would cost to own and what you're paying in rent, invest that, and Let's check in in 25 years and see who did better, a homeowner or an aggressive stock market investor. So my advice to you, my anonymous friend, keep earning, keep saving, and keep your eye on that ball, on that prize of owning a home in the next two years. It's going to go by like that. And in the meantime, start to reverse engineer what it will mean to have to get to that $100,000 down payment, a really good credit score and money in the bank so that you can qualify for a really good mortgage. And I don't think you're going to have these bidding wars in two years. I mean, I could be wrong, but I just don't see it given where the economy is going. All right. I hope that was more optimistic than you were anticipating. I try to keep it positive, but also really real. And that's my real talk. Next up, Justin. Not a housing question. It's our it's our one break in this 30 minutes. He says, hey, Farnoosh, I'm a longtime listener and I'm creating a financial plan for my family to navigate us through the years ahead. Your show has been very helpful on that front. I had a question about the benefits of a 529 plan versus a Coverdell account. I've already begun saving for this uh, for my son. He's three. I've begun saving in a fiduciary investment account for him. However, I want his grandparents to contribute because they have expressed interest. They get him nice things, but this year for his birthday, I want to suggest one of those plans, either the Coverdell or 529 or the fiduciary investment account um, so that we can avoid all this... uh, all these toys that are cluttering our house and we want to just become more efficient to his financial freedom. Any advice would be helpful. We are so money. Yes, you are so money. You know, I can offer a little bit of advice here, but it sounds like you really do have a strong handle, Justin, on what you want to do. And as a mom who has parents, grandparents for my kids who love to buy all the things for the grandkids. We have encouraged them to contribute to our 529 plans for our kids. Now, my parents live distant a distance away and they're not here a lot. So when they are here, or when they do see the kids or when they don't even see the kids, they like to send something, right? They want to have a memento. They want to have a video that shows them opening a box from something from Mimi, you know, and I get that. So I don't want to sort of rob them of that. But at the same time, I'm like, look, let's keep the gifts smaller. And here is the link to contribute to their 529 plan. Or what they'll do is they'll Venmo me some cash and I will contribute it directly into their 529 plans. So if you're depending on how savvy your parents are with technology, you know, they could write you a check, they could 
Venmo you. They could t- follow the link to the 529 plan and contribute there. The difference between the Coverdell and the 529 uh, are the following. So the amount that you can contribute to each of these accounts is different. There's more that you can contribute to a 529 plan uh, per year. Coverdell's max you out at $2,000 a year. Uh, with Coverdell's, there are no tax deductions, whereas a 529 plan may have some ta- state tax deductions depending on where you live and the, uh, the fund in your state. You can save for both, for K through 12 and college, so that's the same. And um, the Coverdell is not as easy when it comes to inviting others to contribute, whereas the 529, they'll create a link for you to give to friends and family to contribute. But for the Coverdell, it's not so straightforward. And if you want your parents to contribute, maybe it's where they write you a check and then you contribute, uh, but it's not uh, so flexible. So it's great. You've got something going on. I think that conversation with your parents is very straightforward. You know, it's like college is $400,000 in many cases, uh, depending on where you go. And in 15 years when your son's ready, you know, hopefully inflation isn't where it's at (laughs) all those years, but it's not going to be cheap. So we need all hands on deck, mom and dad. Thanks for your question, Justin. Okay, next up is Laura. Uh, She says, my husband and I have uh, a dream to own a second home and uh, we want to do this in a neighboring state, use it as a vacation home and a rental property. Where do we start? We live in Kansas and we would like to buy in Colorado. I don't have experience in this, Laura, so just caveating with that, but I would start, if I were you, by connecting with the experts on the ground in Colorado in the area that you're looking to buy. That includes a real estate agent, uh, as, as well as maybe even a real estate attorney, as well as existing owners, preferably people who are also using their property as investments because you'll learn from them You know what the rents are, how brisk is the rental market, a real estate agent may be able to share information about the neighborhoods and where you might see more appreciation or more price stability. Really important to have boots on the ground. So definitely visit. We are all in a virtual world now and it's very easy to Zoom, but really going there, showing up, getting a feel for the area, looking at the house. Maybe even once you're doing this, once you've purchased the property to make a visit Tempor- uh, periodically, but at the very least, hiring someone locally to manage the property for you is so important. Not to scare you, but I just read about a friend who is an investment property owner in another state. She went to visit the property after not being there for a while and realized that there were some squatters living in the house. That somebody, I guess, had pretended to be a real estate agent for the house, rented it out to some people. So maybe they weren't squatters, but there was an illegitimate rent contract in place. The police got involved. It was a nightmare, but not to say that's going to happen to you, but that's why it's important to, to the best of your ability, be present, if not have somebody who is present and accessible to go to the property, to be a resource for whoever's living there and just check in, just check in. Last, we have a question from Leslie, who is about to buy a home thanks to a loan from a relative who offered to give her cash for an all-cash offer. And Leslie says, yes, I'm very lucky to have them in my family. And this is all in the name of being more competitive as I've already qualified for loans. Once I purchase a home, I will need to take out another loan to pay them back. What type of credit would you recommend for this? They suggested a HELOC um, because it might be a, a better interest rate, a good way to go. What do you think? So Leslie, first of all, pretty awesome that you have this uh, this rich relative who can afford this for you and um, it will probably help you seal that deal. A HELOC, a home equity line of credit, is essentially a loan against the value of the home, the equity of the home. And because you're buying all cash, you have 100% equity. Uh, the loan, the HELOC, may be uh, more like 75 or 80% of the value of the home. So you may still be left with a little bit that you're going to have to come up with in another way to pay back your relative. So you could do the HELOC and essentially HELOC is like a line of credit. You can take out the entire line of credit, start paying that back, but use the funds to pay your relative. And then with that 20% sort of deficit, coming up with a different payment plan, maybe it's a personal loan agreement that you create with your relative. I think a HELOC, one thing you have to keep in mind is that the rates are usually variable and they adjust 
uh, based on where interest rates are going and we know where they're going. So it's important that you have a plan to pay this off uh, sooner rather than later, especially in a rising rate environment. You could later refinance that HELOC into a fixed mortgage which is something that I actually did in the mid-2000s, I uh, had a similar scenario where my parents took equity out of their home. This was also, by the way, a very unusual time in our history, right? Everybody's homes had appreciated, inflated. We were in a bubble. My parents took out equity from their home, gave me that cash to, to buy a, a studio, all cash. The next day, I went to a bank, took out a HELOC against the value of the home, paid them back about 80% of what they had given me, then uh, over the years, paid them back the remainder. And also over the years, as interest rates were going up and I didn't want to keep paying more interest, I locked it by refinancing into a mortgage, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. So there's a lot of sort of strategic maneuvering you can do once this is done. If your relative is flexible uh, and is willing to sort of work with you in such a way where they get maybe a lump sum right away, a majority lump sum back right away, and then the rest, you work out a separate a separate plan. That might be the best way to go. I mean, there are personal loans you can take out, but I think the rates will be higher. Credit cards, forget it. I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to say goodbye. I'm going to say have a good weekend. Thank you for joining. And until next time, if you're not subscribing to our newsletter, the link is in the show notes. If you're listening to this show and you want to see what I'm wearing today, go to YouTube and uh, check out the video that accompanies this podcast. The link is in the show notes. And I hope your weekend is so money. 